Hello everyone, my name is Lisa Dolovich and I'm really pleased to welcome you to this next segment of the 2021 Open Summit that is being co-hosted by the Ontario Pharmacy Evidence Network and the Centre for Practice Excellence at the Leslie Dan Faculty of Pharmacy at the University of Toronto. So uh, really pleased today to co-host this uh, segment with Annalise Mathers, the research, a research officer from the University of Toronto. Annalise is going to be front and center in uh, moderating our question and answer. And she's really been the, the backbone of putting all of these events together. So thank you so much, Annalise, on behalf of the Open Executive. Um, I'm a member of the Open Executive team, along with Nancy Waite, Sherilyn Hool, and Lisa McCarthy. Uh, and, and all of us with Annalise and Mansour Mehdi are really, really pleased to be able to uh, put this forward with you today. Um, looking forward to a great set of presentations. Uh, but before I start, I do want to, um, do want to uh, share uh, the territorial acknowledgement. Um, and I think that's just an important way to get us uh, set in terms of our mindset uh, going forward today. So um, I acknowledge that I'm on the traditional territory of the many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, uh, the Wendat peoples, and that this land continues to be home to diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. Um, we recognize uh, and we're really pleased that many of you are joining us today from many different territories and we invite you to provide your own acknowledgement of the ancestry of the land and the commitments made to these peoples. Um, so we wanted to uh, just share a little bit about OPEN and we've done this in our previous uh, weeks as well. So the Ontario Pharmacy Evidence Network is a team of multidisciplinary researchers who are working together to evaluate the quality outcomes and value of medication management services that pharmacists and other healthcare professionals provide. And although our name says Ontario, we do, uh, we do and are very pleased that we collaborate with people across Canada and across the world in many of the ventures that we, uh, we endeavor in. And I'm um, also very glad that some of, some of you have joined us here today. Um, we want to uh, really foster knowledge translation exchange and capacity building as well as we really work to look at how to meet the needs of Ontario, Ontario's vulnerable populations, but also uh, populations around the world uh, as it relates to medication management. Uh, next slide, please. And we're co-hosting, OPEN is co-hosting this event with the Center for Practice Excellence, which is at the Leslie Dan Faculty of Pharmacy that as well looks at medication management research and innovation uh, to drive educational programs that practice and revolutionize patient care. So again, we are uh, a, a network as well with CPE. Many of us, I guess, cross over and wear hats with OPEN and CPE. And really, we like to think of ourselves as a family. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we have had a great four weeks so far over the, this, these past, uh, I guess, month or so since we started on day one on February 10th. And we're really pleased that we're now at day four. It's been a fabulous uh, time uh, in, in our summit, which has been virtual uh, for two hours at a time these past four weeks. Um, I encourage any of you who would like to uh, hear uh, weren't able to participate in the previous weeks, that all of the presentations are online uh, on the CPE website uh, with links so that you can, you can go back and hear uh, the presentations that were done before. And we're really looking forward, of course, to a great slate of presentations today. Uh, the event today will be audio and video recorded as, has, as the previous events were. And as I mentioned, the recordings are going to be available on our website shortly. Um, it may take us a few days to get the recordings uh, up there, but uh, please do keep checking back if there's a presentation that you want to go back to or you want to share the links with others. And we do encourage you to uh, also share these links with others so that we can um, propagate the great work that people are going to present today. Uh, so please feel free to share the links with your networks uh, as these links become live. Uh, we're going to be moderating the question and answer period using the chat box feature in Zoom. There's a lot of us here today. Difficult to have people use their actual audio to answer questions. Um, so please use the chat box to type in your questions, your comments, your constructive feedback. We've had some really great chat sessions uh, during these, uh, these uh, events uh, previously. 
uh, where people will be able to answer questions, chat back and forth while the presentations are going on. So I encourage you to use the chat, chat function as well. Uh, the, the aim of our summit is to disseminate and share knowledge generated through research. Uh, so we do ask that participants recognize that some of the research that's being presented is, is still in progress and refrain from sharing specific results and data, including through social media. Uh, that doesn't mean we don't want you to share that presentations are going on through social media. We do encourage you to tweet about the presentations uh, either today while this is going on or uh, you know, over the subsequent days, if you're going to amplify what you've heard, um, but we would ask that you don't share anything very specific about uh, emerging data that may be presented today. So like I said, we have a great slate of presentations today. Uh, we're going to kick it off with Frank Moriarty, who I'm going to introduce in a minute. Uh, we're gonna then go through um, uh, two, uh, two submitted presentations and then have a break at two o'clock. And then we'll have another three submitted presentations. And then we're going to hear from Kelly Grunrod at round 250 uh, to provide her uh, insight in terms of uh, discussing some of the presentations that we've heard today. And we will aim to finish this event at three o'clock. So it's now my really great pleasure to introduce Frank Moriarty. Uh, he is a pharmacist and lecturer at the School of Pharmacy and Biomolecular Sciences at RC, RCSI University of Medicine and Health Sciences in Dublin, Ireland. So we thank Frank for joining us. Uh, it is around dinner time for him. Uh, and thank, you know, thankfully, uh, you know, with virtual, virtual these days, we can uh, nicely invite uh, people from across the pond to visit us uh, through this means today. So we're really pleased that Frank's able to join us. He's also a visiting research fellow at the Iris Longitudinal Study on Aging, or TILDA, and his research focuses on appropriate prescribing and deprescribing and medicines policy, advancing pharmacist roles and making the best use of health data to inform policy and practice. And he's really going to be able to lead us off in thinking about medication management and the health system, which many of our presentations will be you know, focused on uh, over the course of the day. So Frank, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you in, in our community today, and we look forward to hearing your remarks now. Thanks so much, Lisa, and thank you very much to the Open team for the invitation to speak to you this afternoon or this evening as it is in Dublin. Um, hopefully you can see my slides okay. Um, perfect, I will fire ahead. Uh, so this is uh, the front of uh, RCSI in, in central Dublin on a, on a sunny day, as I was mentioning earlier. I haven't seen the building in uh, almost a year now, so uh, just a, a little reminder of that. Um, just to start with, the new disclosures I have to make are funding from the Irish uh, Health Research Board um, for a couple of um, research projects, but no other uh, disclosures to, to make. To start with, I wanted to pose a question to everyone. Does anyone know uh, what the three areas in green on this map have in common? So if you want to feel free, if you want to throw any answers into the chat box there, you might think it's that Ireland and Labrador are at pretty much the same latitude, but as you can see here, uh, Montserrat in the Caribbean is pretty, you know, pretty far away in terms of uh, climate and, and many other things. I don't know if we've any answers because I probably can't see uh, things that are coming through but the thing that they have in common is that these are the three places in the world where St. Patrick's Day is a public holiday and uh, St. Patrick's Day is two weeks away uh, from today so um, if you're fortunate of, to, enough to be in um, Newfoundland or Labrador uh, I'd like to you know wish you a, a happy St. Patrick's Day in advance but for everyone else you know I think uh, you have permission to celebrate it as well. So into the, I suppose, the meat of the discussion, maybe, um, the first question that arose for me in preparing for this talk today was, what do we mean by improvement, you know, talking about improving the system? And the perspective I took um, was that improvement should be enhanced care, healthcare quality. So the Institute of Medicine defines six domains in terms of healthcare quality. Uh, so this is safety, uh, effectiveness, patient-centeredness, timeliness, efficiency, and equity. And I suppose in thinking about actions we might want to take to try and improve the system, we should be mindful that while improving 
uh, some of these, we hope that our actions don't negatively impact on, on any of these domains. So, for example, improving timeliness, but at the expense of equity. So keeping in mind that there are multiple, uh, I suppose, aspects to quality that we want to at least maintain or improve. What kind of actions um, you know, might it involve to try and target some of these um, areas of quality? Well, I'm sure actually all of the research presented over the days of the summit so far um, have aimed in some way to improve uh, the health system. But broadly, I suppose we can think about uh, improving the system in terms of doing more, doing less, so deprescribing as, as, uh, as was mentioned already and I know is of interest to a number of uh, people on the, uh, the session today, as well as doing things differently. So I suppose there's a huge variety of things we could be doing to try and improve the health system. Um, and uh, I suppose one way of conceptualizing uh, some of the interventions we might consider uh, the Cochrane um, EPOC group, so uh, for effective practice and organization of care, have developed a taxonomy of healthcare interventions, uh, including things like delivery or financial arrangements or implementation strategies uh, in order to classify the various ways we might uh, target healthcare improvement. So speaking for myself, uh, it can be very easy, uh, certainly I know, to, to get very focused on one category of uh, intervention types. So I particularly like this comprehensive framework uh, as a way of, I suppose, conceptualizing the range of possible ways um, we might aim to enhance healthcare quality. So I'm afraid I can't offer a comprehensive overview of quality improvement uh, and quality improvement methods. But instead, over the course of the next um, kind of 10, 15 minutes or so, I'm going to focus on a few themes from my own experience to date uh, that I think are important facilitators for healthcare improvement. And I'm going to touch on some research that I've been um, involved in or, or other research that I'm aware of that I suppose maybe um, shows good practice in, in these areas. So these themes I'm going to touch on, uh, firstly, capturing data on practice. Secondly, looking at evaluating the effective interventions uh, that we might implement. And lastly, learning from some of the challenges. So first, capturing data on practice. I suppose knowing where we are is critical to healthcare improvement. Very much like the classic clinical audit cycle, measuring current practice against standards is important to try and identify where improvement efforts could be targeted to. This data may take various forms, so including things like um, routine data, um, data collected as part of research. And yeah, having this kind of, uh, capturing this kind of data on practice, it's really useful for things like audit and feedback and um, service planning uh, as examples. So I'm gonna focus on, on kind of routine data and then research data as well, as I suppose two ways of capturing um, what current practice is like. Firstly, firstly, in terms of routine data, um, I know Ontario has a great example in uh, ICES in terms of a, you know, a great um, routine source of, of um, healthcare and, and medication prescribing data. But I'm going to highlight a, an example a little closer to home from the UK. So this is uh, specifically openprescribing.net. So this is a platform uh, developed by the data lab at the University of Oxford which compiles monthly anonymized prescribing data for every GP practice in England and has developed a, a range of measures and dashboards that uh, GPs, policymakers, researchers, or, or anyone uh, can use to explore prescribing on a national, regional, or local level. So an example here is um, looking at omega-3 supplement prescribing um, and variation uh, in, in terms of geographical area and seeing that the, the Isle of Wight here seems to have a, a great affinity for, for omega-3 supplements. Um, so yeah, they, they've created a range of measures which allow visualization of um, geographical prescribing variation, as well as indicators where GP practice can benchmark themselves um, against others. So two examples here being uh, high dose opioid use, um, as well as prescribing of pregabalin. So I suppose two um, types of prescribing where there's potential perhaps for misuse or other safety issues occurring. So I think this platform or you know, this type of platform is potentially of significant value in identifying areas for improved prescribing practice, both on a local level, obviously putting them in the hands of you know, healthcare professionals to um, help drive change locally, as well as uh, you know for for regional or national um, uh, planners 
The other type of data I wanted to focus on is research data. So uh, thankfully, I do have a nice example to share from Ireland on this. Uh, as Lisa mentioned, uh, TILDA, the Irish Longitudinal Study on Aging, um, is an organisation I'm, I'm affiliated with. Um, so very much like the I suppose, Health and Retirement Survey in the US or the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. Uh, TILDA uh, is a longitudinal study aiming to assess the health, economic and social circumstances uh, of Irish adults to understand what it's like to grow old in Ireland. It's been ongoing since 2010 and uh, started off with just over 8,000 uh, adults aged 50 and over. This just shows, uh, I suppose, how the, the, the follow-up has gone um, over waves. So, uh, subsequent uh, waves following up the same individuals over time have been conducted every two years um, with an additional objective health assessment um, at every second wave. So unfortunately this, this diagram is a bit out of date. We did have wave five uh, in 2018. Wave six was due to happen uh, last year but uh, was delayed due to COVID and is now underway uh, being conducted as a telephone, um, a telephone questionnaire as opposed to administered in person. The TILDA website uh, provides more information on the study design, but I suppose given the, the pharmacy audience here this, uh, this afternoon, uh, I suppose I wanted to flag that self-reported medication use is captured as part of TILDA, including non-prescription medicines, uh, herbal medicines and supplements. So I'm the medication uh, working group lead in TILDA, so I uh, can confirm that these are you know, well-structured ATC coded uh, data. Um, that uh, a lot of blood, sweat and tears have gone into. So um, the other thing I suppose to highlight um, again via the TILDA website, a public version of the data sets from each wave of the study um, are also available for re researchers to request access. So I suppose this is a means of helping to ensure that um, you know best use is made of this rich uh, data source. And um, if anyone is interested in more information about TILDA, the medications data or otherwise, um, or would like to use it, please you know feel free to reach out if there's anything I can uh, do in terms of advice on that. The website also lists various outputs from the study. So, um, it's so some of these outputs include reports that have been um, developed on a variety of topics to try and inform policy and practice around aging in Ireland. So, this was an example of um, a gate speed assessment and using that to inform um, the timing of pedestrian uh, traffic signals um, for, for crossing the road um, to ensure, I suppose, that you know the, the a sufficient time was provided so that you know. Uh, people who were uh, out and had you know reduced gate speed were still capable of crossing the road in the time available. Other examples include looking at um, healthcare utilisation um, in response to changing uh, public healthcare entitlement and more recently looking at um, high-risk categories of individuals uh, for COVID-19 and their distribution by uh, county in Ireland uh, so to give a, a, an information on the demographic spread there. An example on the medication side of things, uh, this is uh, a study we conducted, um, which is actually just hot off the presses, it was published this morning, so uh, very timely, uh, looking at aspirin use uh, in the TILDA cohort, um, and relating this, I suppose, to cardiovascular disease and uh, morbidity. So when we looked at aspirin use within the TILDA cohort, we found, as you'd expect, uh, I suppose, maybe the more severe the cardiovascular morbidity, the higher the prevalence of use of uh, aspirin or some other um, uh, antiplatelet or anticoagulant drug was. Um, and then I suppose as you move down the, um, the order in terms of, you know, how severe um, a, a condition perhaps someone had, um, the, you know, more people who weren't being treated with any um, antithrombotic agent. So this is looking at it in relative terms, but when we put it in um, looked at it in absolute terms, um, we found that, uh, as you'd expect, I suppose, that most of the individuals who were using um, aspirin um, were, I suppose, at a low cardiovascular risk that, you know, often taking it for primary prevention, uh, where the, um, I suppose, balance of benefits and um, harms are, are uh, less certain that there is a net benefit for patients. The advantage of TILDA is that because it's nationally representative, we can scale some of these estimates up to the national population. So um, when we found that, I suppose, uh, over three quarters of aspirin users um, did seem to be using it for primary prevention, 
this equates to about 200,000 um, individuals in, in Ireland. Um, and on the other side, we found that, um, you know, a small proportion of people who had previous uh, cardiovascular events didn't report using aspirin or any other antithrombotics. So um, again, highlighting that there's a, I suppose, a scale of an issue uh, there to potentially be addressed. Moving on to evalu evaluating the effect of healthcare interventions, I suppose, um, this is a, I suppose, a vital component for any uh, learning health system that's that's aiming to uh, improve. So we need to know if changes we're implementing are having a positive effect. So we should aim to produce the best evidence possible. So using evidence to inform the interventions or changes that are being considered and building on previous progress to, you know, um, improve in small incremental steps. We should try and evaluate um, you know, any interventions with the strongest study design possible, but fitting this uh, design to the context, you know, not everything can be evaluated in a randomized controlled trial. So you know, if it's a, a policy change that's been implemented, looking at quasi-experimental studies uh, as a means of evaluating these. So I suppose trying to perhaps move away from the traditional um, pure view of an evidence hierarchy of study designs to instead uh, considering that the best research we can do is often lots that it doesn't necessarily uh, depend so much on design, but being thoughtful, well designed, and well conducted. So, thinking about some um, larger um, policy changes, which maybe you know aren't in the hands of researchers or clinicians to try and implement and evaluate in a perfect way. Um, looking to these quasi-experimental um, methods that I mentioned, um, an example of evaluating such a policy change um, is this paper from the team at Open Prescribing, so this UK prescribing platform that I mentioned, who assessed uh, a guideline change recommending nitrofurantoin over trimethoprim for urinary tract infections. So not only did they quantify what the impact of this uh, change in guidance was, um, the, the nifty thing I think that they did was they, um, using this, this um, public data, identified variation in practice and I suppose identified those primary care organisations um, who either, you know, did or didn't change um, uh, their prescribing and they actually surveyed them to try and identify the areas of best practice that, that were implemented in these, I suppose, maybe well-performing um, uh, organizations where, you know, uh, I suppose a shift in prescribing was fairly evident uh, immediately after the guideline change um, to try and identify what those um, actions were and to try and share best practice um, uh, with, with, I suppose, maybe those who are slower to, to adopt the new guideline. We've done some research in this area, not, not as, um, uh, as nice as that, or certainly with uh, no, no nice graphs to show, but um, I suppose we took a, a similar approach using the same data source to look at a um, safety warning in relation to uh, Mirabegron for um, overactive bladder. Um, and again, looking at the adoption of um, that safety warning and reduction in prescribing of, of uh, Mirabegron, uh, particularly looking at what um, what types of GP practices uh, didn't alter their prescribing following this safety warning. So moving away from policy changes um, to things like changes in healthcare delivery or you know um, implementing new interventions or new, new roles, um, there can often be a tension I suppose between uh, evidence and implementation. Uh, like the chicken and the egg, um, which should come first? You know is it a case of building the evidence for change before it's implemented um, or implementing a, you know, a change or a new intervention and then evaluating it afterwards. Often we think evidence is needed for implementation, but you know, this, this doesn't always happen. Uh, sometimes something is, is implemented without you know, a clear evidence base, um, but it's still uh, vital to evaluate, um, uh, even if something has been implemented, just to ensure that I suppose that it is providing net benefits um, and yeah, to identify those cases where you know something that has been implemented isn't um, providing a net benefit um, and then you know that raises the challenges I suppose of de-implementation uh, if something isn't shown to be beneficial. Uh, taking I suppose two examples of, the, of this kind of chicken and egg uh, scenario um, fr from my own personal experience uh, in England um, uh, GP practice-based pharmacists um, have, I suppose, been, been a long-standing um, role or position with many GP practices or primary care organizations um, employing pharmacists to work in their practice uh, over the last number of decades. And then in 2015, uh, NHS England um, uh, 
provided funding to extend this nationwide. So um, I suppose at the time when this, this funding came through, uh, there was relatively little in the way of kind of gold standard RCT evidence that practice-based pharmacists were beneficial. Um, but I suppose it was implemented and there's extensive evaluation that's been running alongside this scale up. On the other side, in Ireland, we've had the opposite, where, where such a role doesn't exist formally, um, and we're slowly developing that evidence base and um, looking to experience in the UK, and obviously from the impact project uh, in Ontario as well. So we have conducted a feasibility study where pharmacists worked in GP practices to identify opportunities for optimizing medicines, improving clinical um, and cost effectiveness, as well as identifying opportunities for deprescribing. So this uh, resulted in a couple of uh, publications looking at the kind of, I suppose, quantitative and qualitative uh, aspects of this, of this uh, study. And it's now progressed to a pilot randomized uh, uh, cluster, uh, uh, cluster control trial, um, which is due to commence later in the year. I suppose in conducting this feasibility study, we really engaged closely with kind of some key policymakers um, who provided input into the um, study design, conduct, and then dissemination as well. Um, and I suppose this, this evidence has helped to support a number of developments. Uh, first, the new state contract with GPs in Ireland in 2019 included a provision for medicine usage reviews that will be supported by pharmacists working across GP practices. The second uh, development was the health service executive, so again, the Irish uh, health service uh, secured EU funding to participate in a joint um, project to improve medicines management um, uh, along with Northern Ireland and Scotland. Um, this will result in the rollout of uh, practice-based pharmacists across 10 to 12 practices in the next couple of years um, on a pilot basis. So uh, again, this kind of uh, our evidence from our feasibility study um, helped form some of the basis to, to progress these things. And lastly, as I wrap up, uh, I suppose learning from challenges um, Often uh, a crisis uh, may precip precipitate significant change in, in, in practice and I suppose aim, aiming to improve uh, the health system. And I suppose COVID has shown this uh, to be the case very much so. Um, this recent review was published in Research and Social and Administrative Pharmacy and um, highlighted the many cases in Europe, Canada and the US where pharmacist roles have been extended. Um, in Ireland, we saw pharmacists being able to extend prescription duration, um, as well as the introduction of electronic prescribing um, in response to the, the, the onset of the pandemic. Other examples in the review are pharmacists performing COVID um, tests or, or administering vaccines, um, or a generic or therapeutic substitution to try and avoid drug shortages. So there's one way this uh, seeing these kind of changes may be frustrating for those who've maybe been advocating, you know, for many years and building, you know, a careful evidence base on how best to, to you know, perhaps implement some of these new roles um, and then to see them implemented overnight, perhaps with not due regard for that evidence base. Um, but even if they're, I suppose, uh, implemented in an imperfect fashion, you know, we can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. It's still important to, you um, I suppose, you know, welcome some of these extensions, evaluate them, and again, try and uh, work towards maybe improving them in the post-COVID era. Uh, I'm involved in a team that's actually doing just this in terms of medication safety in Ireland. So um, with this kind of shift towards e-prescribing telehealth medicines delivery, I suppose the threats to medication safety that can um, result in, um, we're setting out to develop a toolkit that will, um, I suppose, hope to mainstream some of the best practices that have been introduced in response to these changes, as well as guard against some of the threats to medication safety. So we're using a, um, a design research uh, approach kind of married with health services research uh, called the double diamond um, to try and, uh, yeah, evaluate this problem and try and design the right thing and then um, design things right uh, in, in terms of optimizing that for, for implementation. So just to finish, uh, I suppose we've a, a fantastic schedule of um, presentations that are uh, coming up right after this, um, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, and I thought I might offer a few um, uh, I suppose, reflections on what I've touched on, uh, as well as kind of pre-reflections pre pre-reflections on, on some of the uh, talks we have to come. So um, I suppose, bearing in mind that, you know, looking to improve the health system, it's a range of research methods and study designs that we should be embracing. Uh, ditto for disciplines, health-related as well as more broadly, you know, looking to fields like design um, as ways to improve the health system. Uh, technology can play an important role, but I suppose it's not, you know, there are still ways to improve without uh, technology as well. 
and there's multiple targets I suppose we can look at so thinking about you know education patients health system or services and um, uh, engaging with carers there's lots of ways potentially we can uh, improve the system so lastly just to um uh, uh, thank you very much for your attention to acknowledge um, some of the uh, PIs of the studies that I've mentioned, as well as co-authors on uh, some of the papers that I've highlighted, um, to acknowledge the funders uh, of, the, of the research I've discussed. And yeah, again, thank you very much and uh, leave my contact details in case uh, anyone would like to reach out uh, afterwards. So thanks very much. Thank you so much, Frank, for, for providing that keynote for us. Um, and thank you as well for sharing some of the research. Congrats on that recent publication. I think thank that's you. very fortuitous that that happened. Um, also speaks to the time change between Canada and Ireland, if you getting that <laughs> well before we would have here. Um, just in the name of time, I think I'll ask, Lisa was just wondering if the Open Prescribing Initiative is also moving to standardize indicators internationally um, and looking at opportunities. I believe it's the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. Um, here in Canada and opportunities for collaboration maybe there. Yeah, for sure. I think, you know, the, um, particularly, I know Tilda in, in its design very much looked to other existing longitudinal studies of aging to try and see, you know, even standardizing measures across, um, you know, the, the health and retirement survey, et cetera. Um, to ensure that I suppose there would be potential for harmonization and, you know, cross country um, collaborations and comparisons. Um, I think, to, uh, if I'm right in thinking CLSA probably came after TILDA since 2010, but mm -hmm. again, I'm sure there's a lot of commonalities there in terms of, um, you know, how certain data is collected. So yeah, hu huge potential to, um, I suppose, do comparative work there. That's great. So we'll put a little plug for that for everyone on that <laughs> <laughs> opportunity to collaborate. Um, well, thank you again so much, Frank. I'm going to turn it over to Lisa to get us started on the oral research presentations. Um, but I think there are a few questions for you in the chat if you're able to maybe go I'll, back and I'll forth. pop through. Yeah, sure Thanks thing. so much. Yeah, that's great. Thank you again, Frank. I, I agree there's lots of opportunity for collaboration across our, our groups. And uh, for those looking for projects, uh, this, these are great ideas that Frank's put forward. Um, and I will encourage as and least people to continue the conversation with Frank in the chat and, and amongst uh, the community here uh, while we turn to also listen to our next speaker, which is Suzanne Cataret. And I'm really pleased to be able to introduce Suzanne, who's an associate professor of pharmacy and epidemiology at the University of Toronto and a fellow of the WHO Collaborating Center in Governance, Accountability and Transparency in the pharmaceutical pharmaceutical sector and a senior adjunct scientist at ICES. Her primary research interests are in pharmacoepidemiology, health services, and pharmacy practice research. And she's going to uh, really, I think, share some exciting um, uh, observations and uh, tell us about the Open Atlas at 2020 and 2021, I think, too. So, Suzanne, over to you. Uh, great. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Yes, Excellent. So I'm going to get right started. Thanks for the introduction. I won't mention my title because I'm just going to dive right in. Um, okay. Although I have no conflicts of interest to disclose, I would like to acknowledge the original support from the Ontario Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. So the Ontario government through an open funding and uh, more recent support uh, for the current research that I'm presenting today through a Clinical Social Administrative Pharmaceutical Sciences Research Award. Uh, from the Leslie Dam Faculty of Pharmacy and a shout out to the Center for Practice Excellence because we just saw launch our Atlas tool this morning. So I'll mention that briefly right now. So if you go to the Center for Practice Excellence site uh, and toggle down, you'll see the, a, a new link and that's where the Atlas sits. Uh, you can walk through it, it's interactive. There's trends, uh, three different tabs uh, with trends that that you can interact by region, also by type of service and age and sex counts and rates, as well as some fun interactive maps. Now we're still working on it. We just launched it this morning in terms of functionality over the next week. That's why we're calling it a soft launch so we can see what it looks like and uh, kind of play with it a bit. So if you have any feedback, please provide it to us. Um, the other fun news is that we have several research briefs on the different services planned uh, over this year and uh, coming year. The first one is going to be an overview that really goes into more methodological detail and it's coming out in the May-June issue of uh, Canadian Pharmacist Journal, so stay tuned for that. 
Now, uh, a brief overview of what I'm talking about in terms of these professional pharmacist services. Um, they've been on the map in Ontario since 2007, starting with the MedsCheck program in 2007, and then brought into specific patient populations in 2010. Then the Pharmaceutical Opinions program was funded for renumerating pharmacists for connecting with prescribers about potential uh, changes to medications. Uh, the smoke and cessation program was launched in 2011. That includes not only uh, prescription medication, but pharmacist counseling services, the influenza program in 2012. And then it's just of, of interest to note some major policy changes happened to all this, the suite of the MedCheck program in 2016. My focus to, oh, and, and that's just an aside that there's little nuances in terms of eligibility that changed over time. Uh, but my focus today is really on the what's happened since 2020. I'm gonna start the story since January because there was a major policy change that actually was initiated in 2020. And that is uh, the, the long-term care changed from a fee-for-service model to fee for bed capitation model. That means that pharmacists no longer submit claims for remuneration. So we no longer can see meds check long-term care or pharmaceutical opinion services because it's uh, they're paid based on beds. Uh, so that's an interesting uh, comment. Now, the other thing, which was the original <laughs> the idea that we wanted to look at was what, what, what happened when the state of an emergency was announced in March. And it was mid-March to late March. And what happened? The Ontario government, well, actually Canada really world, uh, uh, nationwide, but the Ontario government specifically encouraged physical distancing, stay at home, stay safe, don't travel, don't even travel to your pharmacy if you can, if you, if you don't have to, or at the grocery store, you know, you, you know, stay safe. So this was all to encourage stopping the spread of COVID-19. So those are kind of the disruptions. But then also we had some uh, broadening of opportunities with now MedsCheck was approved to be able to be offered uh, more virtually than it was before. So some, so there was also some opportunities that were potential um, through the, the disruptions. And then more recently COVID-19 testing in some pharmacies. And I'm okay if you turn my video on, by the way, Annalise, I realize it's off. Um, if, if that matters. Um, so what we've looked at for what I'm presenting today are all claims submitted through to August 2020. Those are the data that we had at the time. And so these are all the data uh, submitted to the provincial government that are housed at ICES and we're focusing on trends. The story does that start though with the, the impact of the 2016 policy change that we've previously published. Uh, a huge impact on all the suite of MedsCheck services. Uh, well, I shouldn't say all, all the community services. I'm talking about this because there was very little change in the long-term care. And that makes sense if you look at our paper and um, and I forgot to, to include the reference there. Ahmed Shaker is the first author there. So apologies for that, that it's logical. It didn't make an impact on long-term care because they were already mandated in long-term care to provide long uh, MedCheck type services. So it makes sense that the policy change didn't impact long-term care. So now we're gonna go through, and I'm keeping 2016, so you can look at the relative difference of that prior policy change. So after 2016, uh, all meds check services, again, were hardly hit. There was a bit of recovery. And then the story today is about what happened in 2020. The announcement was in March, but it was towards the end of March. So we really see it starting to hit in April. Yet we also see quite a bit of recovery. So it'll be interesting to see when we update our data, what happens. Um, so this is for MedCheck Annual uh, for all of them. And if we look, we fine tune a little bit more on the, the type of service. So the follow-up services, we see this is physicians or nurse practitioner follow-up. So there wasn't very much of a change there. So that, that's, that's good news. It makes sense that there was a huge drop immediately for planned hospital admissions because any optional uh, surgeries were canceled. Uh, and so if there's fewer surgeries, there's gonna be fewer planned hospital admissions. And so that's logical. And it looks like it's starting to creep up. Similarly with hospital discharge, there's fewer surgeries, there's fewer discharges. This is logical. But again, uh, it's comforting that it's creeping up. A similar story with MedCheck diabetes. So a huge drop in 2016, we start to see a bit of a, an increase, maybe slightly an increase over time drop, looks like it's recovering. 
Nice Jack home in contrast. So here's the green. So here's the luck of the Irish here <laughs> coming, um, getting your med check service at home because of the physical distancing, it makes sense that it dropped and it hasn't really uh, been able to, to recover. Uh, now going on to med check long-term care, it's now a black box because we don't receive the data yet I would anticipate because it's mandated that it hasn't really changed, uh, but we really don't know. Uh, but that's a nice, drop uh, or backdrop into what's happening with the pharmaceutical opinions program because we see an immediate drop in January. Previously we hadn't looked at uh, services differentiated by community versus long-term care. So clearly something happened before COVID, the COVID-19 disruptions, and we attribute this to uh, the, the, the med check, or so I should say, so I'm distracted because I'm, I'm just going to stop my cat from playing with something next to me because I'm sure she's making lots of noise. Sorry about that. We adopted a kitten uh, at Christmas, so um, she's, she's a little messy. Uh, so where was I? So we don't see much of a change and, uh, and it's hard to say what impact there was then with uh, COVID-19 on pharmaceutical opinions. Smoke and cessation is also kind of an interesting story and I've, include, I've included all of the data because we see after an initial, uh, you know, encouraging uptake, there's been a slow and steady decline over time. And we talk about this more in our brief um, that, that will be coming out um, at some point, <laughs> hopefully in the next year. Uh, and so in terms of uh, what happened with the COVID-19 disruptions, we do see some, a drop that did not recover. So it was impacted, I would say, and we can, we'll do eventually a, a, a time series on this one to actually comment on that. So in conclusion, or our discussion is uh, that pharmacist services are readily impacted by policy changes. And that in particular long-term care services, we saw because of that policy change in January, 2020, it's unfortunate that we can no longer comment on whether the meds check services are, I, I would think that they're being done because it's it, they're mandated to be done, but also those pharmaceutical opinion services. Um, an immediate impact of COVID disruptions on all services across the board. Uh, however, because pharmacy is an essential service, readily adapted, especially when uh, there was the option to do services virtually. The hardest hit were the meds check planned hospital admissions, which makes sense in the meds check at home, as, also, uh, as well as smoking cessation services. And so the next steps for us are to update the data through to the end of May 2021. So that's what Lisa was getting at with 2021 so that we can describe the whole suite of the 2020 services, but also the 2020-21 influenza season, because we want to capture all the data and add in COVID testing and pharmacies. So that's what I have. I just want to acknowledge um, co-authors, in particular, Maha Chowdhury, who created all those beautiful figures and all those interactive figures on the school when you get to go play with them. Again, the Center for Practice at, uh, for Practice Excellence for hosting the, the, the interactive tool. The broader list of trainees, we, actually there's quite a long list of Atlas team members of, of scientists, but I focused on the, the trainees here. Uh, and our communications team at uh, the University of Toronto for, again, uh, helping make uh, our, our, our vision with the Atlas tool available on the website. And again, CPJ for their openness and enthusiasm to receive our Atlas briefs that start to talk, walk through all of the services. That's wonderful. Thanks so much, Suzanne, for sharing that and also linking to the CPE website. Um, Lisa, thanks for putting that in the chat box. Um, Suzanne, I think that was the first pet appearance we've had <laughs> at a summit event so far. So we made it four weeks before that happened, which is pretty impressive. Um, I'll maybe start with Lisa's question. And I think this is such a good one. I know a little bit about this, but it'll be great for people to hear about it. Is can you talk about how the Atlas data can allow for a deeper dive into the differences between services in services between sexes, age, and other factors? Uh, sure. So the, the Atlas tool that's available online, and, and I, I guess I could literally go to it, uh, and, and maybe I should, well, I, if, if I did, I would slow down and it would be annoying because everyone watched me like fiddle <laughs> with the technology. Unfortunately, I'm not that, that fluid yet, but I'm getting there. Um, so it's really cool. You, hopefully you were able to notice that that map, um, it, was, it was a GIF, so it was changing over time. 
So you can, you'll be able to literally click and choose uh, over time for those maps as an example, or play uh, an animated GIF. You can, for each of those trends, I showed an example, and maybe I'll, I'll go back to it. That's probably the easiest way because it's, it's uh, uh, so here there's a toggle down, there's a street, there's a, a button here that you pull, you can get all the regions or just select regions. Similarly, this is an example of by region, but those other figures that I presented for the, that relate to the COVID-19, um, you saw that they were service specific. So within each of the services, so for pharmaceutical opinions, as an example, you can pick the result. Was it no change? Was it uh, dispensed as, as prescribed? Dispensed as prescribed? Was it not dispensed at all? Was there a change? So you can also toggle between those things. Then for the age and sex, uh, you can pick the season and then you can pick all ages, all sexes, or you can pick uh, specific sex or specific age groups. And the nice thing here, and this is a, a good example, if you only look at counts, uh, it's hard to compare between the different groups because uh, there may be different number of people alive or living in the province in the different age groups. So once you adjust for the number of people in the province, then the, the picture becomes a bit more clear. Great, thanks for giving us. It's such an interactive tool, which is so nice. And I think that's, yeah, just really exciting to have it launched um, on our website now. Um, I'll maybe follow up with a question from Cheryl. She asks, is the data set being used to compare to services by other healthcare professionals, such as physician service, MD physician services? I think that's a really great question. Is that uh, the data are not currently, but they, they could be. Uh, I, I know that, uh, what well, I can comment that the, there was an influenza immunization paper that looked at the, the comparison between uh, residents who are receiving immunization services in physicians' offices versus pharmacies, as an example. And we really like to look at that over time as well, uh, how that might have changed. Or do people, once they get immunized in a pharmacy, do they tend to stay in a pharmacy? Um, or are they, are they going back and forth between the different uh, services? The other thing I can comment on because we published on it before more broadly. So this is very descriptive. It's not um, besides the, the characteristics that I've talked about today, which are region, age and sex. Um, it, it doesn't go in more depth, but there have been prior descriptive papers. So the smoking cessation, as example, had identified that over 90 percent. And I think it's even closer over. Yeah, about 80, 89 percent. That had a uh, that started smoking cessation services had a physician smoking cessation consultation. So maybe they're already thinking about it. And our takeaway there was the benefit of multimodal, um, the the importance really of multimodal uh, strategies to help people uh, stop smoking. Great, thank you so much. Thanks, Suzanne. I'm going to pass it over to Lisa to introduce our next research presentation. But thank you so much for that. Great, thanks. Great, thank you so much. So I am uh, now very pleased to, uh, to introduce Rand Hussein, who is a PhD candidate at the School of Pharmacy, University of Waterloo, working under the supervision of Dr. Kelly Grinrod, uh, who we're gonna hear from a bit later, the lead behind uh, Pharmacy 5 and 5, and an associate professor at the University of Waterloo School of Pharmacy. Uh, Rand is also a licensed and practicing pharmacist in Ontario and has received her master's degree in clinical pharmacy from the University of Jordan in 2010 and a board certified pharmacotherapy specialist since 2012. So we look forward to hearing about your scoping review. Turning over to you. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Can you see my screen? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, so my name is Rand Hussain from University of Waterloo, and I'm going to be presenting today a scoping review of the uh, effects of computer-based education on healthcare professionals' knowledge, skills, and behavior. Um, so uh, just first of all, I want to say that I have no actual or potential conflict of interest in relation to this uh, presentation. So I'm going to start with a quick uh, definition of computer-based education, which is defined as the delivery of educational content through information and communication technologies. And it's also known as e-learning, online learning, web-based learning, or multimedia learning. And um, computer-based education, of course, um, offers several advantages compared to traditional learning, including being easily updated, interactive, and can be widely distributable. 
uh, which help us deliver content at any time and from anywhere, which saves time and resources as well as reduces travel cost. So when we talk about computer-based education for health, uh, healthcare professionals, um, it has been widely implemented in healthcare education, but unfortunately it's been widely studied uh, in students and trainees. Very few studies have focused on studying computer-based learning on more experienced healthcare professionals. And of the few studies that we were able to identify, they were often of poor quality. Um, the other gap that we identified was that there's uh, limited information about kind of theories that we can use to design educational platform or how we can select features that are designed for platforms uh, used mostly by experienced healthcare professionals. So given the rapid shift toward online education with COVID-19 pandemic, um, um, we did a scoping review approach in order to fill the gap in knowledge. So the objectives were to determine the effect of computer-based education on the uh, knowledge, skills, and behavior of healthcare professionals, and also to determine features of computer-based educational platforms and theories um, that can be used in the design of computer-based education that can enhance healthcare professional satisfaction. So we conducted a scoping review using the five steps, uh, five step framework outlined by RKC O'Malley, um, starting by identifying the research question, identifying relevant studies, selecting studies, charting data, and finally summarizing and reporting data. Uh, studies were included if they uh, specifically evaluated the effect of computer-based education platform on healthcare professionals, uh, clinical knowledge, skills, or behavior, and we tried to focus mostly on pharmacists, doctors, uh, and nurses. The assessment of outcome uh, were organized into the four levels of Kirkpatrick model, with level one including reaction and the degree to which participants find the uh, computer-based intervention satisfying and engaging. Level two including, which reflects the degree to which participant acquired knowledge and skills. Uh, level three for behavior and how much they apply the acquired knowledge and skills and level four for results, which indicates the degree to which patients benefited from uh, participants improved behavior. So studies were excluded if they clearly met, met at least one of, the, uh, of those exclusion criteria. Um, so studies that used, um, so I'm not gonna go through the whole list, but I'm gonna highlight the most important ones. So if if a study is using a, a, a slide based presentation or using a material that's not applicable to be distributed through the internet, we excluded the study. If, if the study is using blended learning as an intervention, meaning that participants were uh, exposed to both in-class teaching and an online teaching, so the intervention was excluded because we wanted to focus on online learning only. Uh, studies that if evaluated or included only uh, students or medical residents were also excluded because we wanted it to focus on experienced healthcare professionals, not just students. So in terms of results, so this is the flow diagram for the scoping review process. Running the search strategy through the database yielded a total of uh, 7,013 uh, relevant studies, um, 1,016 uh, 1,600 studies were removed as duplicates. Uh, then we went through, uh, we did a screening for the titles and abstract of the remaining 5,402 studies. Um, 5,172 studies were excluded and we ended up with 230 studies that underwent full text screening. 213 were excluded. The most common reasons uh, for exclusion were either not meeting the definition of a computer-based education or not uh, like wrong objectives. So they were not examining knowledge or skills or behavioral outcomes. And this yielded a 17 studies, which were included in the uh, review. So in terms of the included studies, of the 17 uh, studies, computer-based educational platforms targeted a wide range of healthcare professionals. Um, so we had nurses, physicians, pharmacists, uh, respiratory therapists, and poisons information specialists. Uh, five studies took place in Netherlands, five took place in Northern America, um, three studies uh, took place in Australia, and the remaining studies were conducted in Poland, Korea, Spain, and Ur uh, Uruguay and Iran. Uh, in terms of research methods, we had eight studies used quasi-experimental design, 
eight randomized controlled trials and one observational study. So in terms of the features that were used, um, the most common were discussion forums and case studies. So 11 studies used discussion um, forums uh, in order to keep the platform as interactive as possible. So, and gave the chance for participants to interact and ask questions. Uh, 11 studies also used case studies or case scenarios or clinical vignettes. So that was another common one. Assessment questions or short quizzes were also common. Nine studies used videos, nine studies used feedback, uh, which means like providing feedback for participants on their performances. Uh, eight studies used uh, additional resources, so they provide their participants with additional resources, re uh, references, and reading material. Other features that were used, but they were not that common, were internal mailbox to send and receive messages and video conferences. So unfortunately, in terms of theories, only two studies out of 17 explicitly mentioned the underlying theory used in developing their computer-based uh, educational intervention. Uh, so we identified two, the eye change model, uh, which usually assess or predict behaviors. Um, so it is, they assessed attitudes, awareness, knowledge, self-efficacy. The second one was the theory of planned behavior, which also focuses on um, assessing uh, behavior intention. So in terms of the outcome, uh, outcome assessment using Kirkpatrick model. So level one, 12 studies assessed users' acceptance, attitude, and satisfaction. Most reported positive effect. Uh, users were usually satisfied with the content. Level two, in terms of knowledge, skills, and confidence was assessed in 14 studies. Uh, all 14 studies shows positive improvement in knowledge gain. Only three studies assessed skills to be specific. Uh, and it, we, we had some sort of mixed results. Um, skills were mostly assessed using OSCE stations or test questions. Knowledge uh, was mostly assessed using multiple choice questions or true false statements. For level three, behavior was assessed in 11 studies. Mostly uh, they used chart audit or a commitment to change statements and we got mixed results on behavior change. Level four in terms of changes in patient outcome was not assessed in any of the included studies. So in terms of discussion, uh, we could say that overall the review showed a positive effect of computer-based education and knowledge and skills. And there is a promising effect of computer-based education on improving uh, behavior. However, I have to highlight that most of the studies use self-reported measure to assess behavior, which could overestimate or lead to inaccurate estimation of actual behaviors. Unfortunately, little information was shared about the theoretical framework used to develop the computer-based intervention or the uh, effect of selected features on healthcare professional satisfaction or learning outcomes. So in terms of uh, conclusion, I would say that computer-based education can enhance knowledge, skills, and to a certain extent, behavior. Uh, we definitely think that future studies should construct their interventions around well-grounded theory to improve the effectiveness of computer-based education on changing healthcare professionals' behavior. And we definitely believe that future studies should explicitly outline the features that further improve learning outcomes, which can help uh, others replicate and learn and guide others on how to select those features for their computer-based education. And that would be it for me. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Rand. Thanks for that presentation. Um, I I'm curious if, if this work is part of anything that you're planning. I know you talked a little bit about future studies, but is that something you and your team are looking at doing is taking some of the findings from the scoping review and applying those um, at a project at the University of Waterloo or, or bro more broadly? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm working under supervision of Dr. Kelly Grunrod, and we are, so um, most of my research and my PhD focuses on Pharmacy 5 and 5, which is a computer-based educational platform designed mostly for pharmacists. So the reason why we did this scoping review is to see what's out there, what, what others are using, especially for more experienced users, because when you look at literature, it's mostly focusing on, as I said, students and trainees. So we want to see what uh, what is more satisfying and engaging for more experienced users. Um, so that, that was the point. And, and, and I've, I've, we've learned about the limited information about theories. 
what kind of theories we can use, but definitely we learned a lot about what kind of features that can be used. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's great. I think this work is really important considering just the transition what we've obviously seen over the past year to um, A, everyone being on a computer and B, working virtually and looking at different opportunities for um, training, behavior change, satisfaction with online platforms. So um, really important work, I think, and it'll be interesting to see what comes next from you. I think that's really exciting. Thank you. Um, so on that note, we now have in our agenda just to take a quick break. So I'm going to recommend um, maybe if we just take a break for two or three minutes, people can grab a glass of water, cup of coffee, um, and we will start off at 2.05 with three more research presentations we'll get going then. But thank you everyone for a great first half of the event today. Thank you.
Okay, so welcome back, everyone. I'm going to hand it back over to Lisa, who's going to get us started with our second set of research presentations. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Annalise. I'm uh, really pleased now to introduce Sadaf Bazel, who is a licensed uh, pharmacist in Ontario with over 10 years of experience in community long term and primary in the primary care setting. Uh, she received her Bachelor of Pharmacy from the University of Karachi in Pakistan and completed a hospital pharmacy residency as well. She's also a board certified geriatric pharmacist through the Board of Pharmacy Specialties in the US. And she currently practices as a clinical pharmacist at the Thames Valley Family Health Team and is pursuing a PhD under the supervision of uh, Dr. Tejal Patel at the University of Waterloo School of Pharmacy. And we're very much uh, looking forward to her presentation on uh, sharing about uh, sharing uh, more about uh, smart adherence devices. So thank you so much. And we'll turn it over to you, Sadaf. Thank you for the introduction, Lisa. Uh, I'm just trying to share my screen. Perfect. Can everyone see? We can see. We can see your screen. We can see the 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 slides not yet in presentation format. Perfect. Yeah. Good. Now we can. Yes. Uh, yes. Go ahead and feel free to turn on the video as well if you like or not. It's your preference. Okay. Um, thank you so much for the introduction, Lisa. And I'm very excited to be a part of Open Summit this year. Um, my research is about integration of a smart adherence products by older adults with chronic diseases and ethnography study. I declare no conflict of interest. Sorry, I'm having some, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so we all know as we age, we tend to gather chronic diseases. Um, one out of every three people of the age 65 and older reported to have two chronic diseases. And the ratio goes up to three out of four. Um, chronic disease management often involves uh, medications usage with long-term therapy and complex medication regimen. Um, I don't think it's a new news for uh, this group of audience that how medication mismanagement can lead to increased healthcare costs, um, reduce the quality of life for patients and increase caregiver burdens. Uh, medication mismanagement has been a very uh, global, has been a big issue for the healthcare systems globally, and a lot of um, interventions has been developed uh, to manage um, medication mismanagement. In the last two decades, there has been, sorry, I'm, oh, sorry. Uh, in the last two decades, there has been a development of um, technology-based adherence products. Uh, these products come in variable features and characteristics ranged from mobile phone application to uh, reminder notification via emails or text messaging to the actual products that can dispense uh, medication. Smart medication adherence products are the type of technology-based products that has the ability to um, ability to track real-time medication intake um, and also sends reminder notifications to the user when the dose is due. Uh, literature review conducted in 2020 identified 51 such products, and out of those 51, 38 products were commercially available for in-home patient use. Therefore, we, uh, there is little um, known about the integration of these products for in-home patients uh, use. Therefore, we designed a study to examine the integration of a prototype smart multi-dose blister package into the daily use of older adults with chronic diseases. We also wanted to explore the medication intake behavior in this patient population. The concept of integration was um, assessed by looking at the usability, acceptability, and functionality of the product. We used an integrated theoretical framework, which was comprised of three um, models. Technology acceptance models was used to assess um, how users can um, Perceive the, tab, uh, perceive the product's usefulness and ease of use along with other factors. We also included two behavioral theories, theory of planned behavior and combi model to assess factors um, that can help us predict the medication intake behavior for older adults. We designed an, so, Smart multi-dose blister package is a prototype product. As you can see in the picture, it's a 
28 cavity blister pack that has the ability to provide up to four time dosing for seven days. Uh, it looks like similar to the blister pack that we usually have in community pharmacies. Um, however, the back of the blister pack has a paper board, which, is, which contains conductive ink um, as shown in the figure. Um, and it also has a 2G connective device, which is attached to each individual blister pack. When the medication, um, when this cavity is broken to access the medication, the conductive ink link gets broken. This information actually tracks the real-time medication intake event, which then gets stored by this 2G connectivity device and upload on a web-based portal periodically. The system also has the ability to send SMS notification um, to patients through cell phones um, for their medication uh, time when the dose is due. The web-based portal is accessible by healthcare providers, um, such as pharmacists. They can log on the portal and download a report, uh, which they can be used uh, when they are talking to their patients about their medication uh, adherence. So we designed a mixed method ethnography study with purposive sampling strategy. Uh, participants were eligible to take part in the study if they were of 18 years of age or older, diagnosed with at least one chronic disease, were on complex medication regimen, which was defined as taking five or more medications per day, or if taking less than five medications per day, taking more than one's daily dosing schedule. They must be self-managing their medications on a regular basis, able to speak English because the reminder notification was only available in English language. Uh, they must have a cell phone with SMS messaging capabilities and allowed in-home visits. So we used various methods to gather data during these in-home visits. Um, ethnography informed participant observations and field notes were uh, used to capture the holistic knowledge about a person's medication taking behavior in their home. We also conducted semi-structured one-on-one -on -one interview at the end of the study. The interview guide was developed by the construct based on the three frameworks, TAM, TBP, and COMBI model, the one that I described earlier. We also added additional questions regarding usability, acceptability, and functionality to capture the integration um, in a wholesome manner. Uh, we did use two quantitative um, methods, system usability scale, which is a scale uh, used to assess usability of a product, and net promoter scale, which is a user, which, which is a simple tool that determines the overall satisfaction of a product. The interview data was analyzed by using the qualitative analysis guide of Levuin or Quaggle framework. So we ended up recruiting 10 participants with a mean age of 76 years. 80% um, of our participants were female. On an average, they were taking 11.1 medications uh, and it ranged from five to 20. Um, on an average, participants reported five chronic diseases, hypertension being the most prevalent one. Uh, the system usability score reported to be 75.5. And I'll just uh, give a little bit of a background of that. So products that have a usability score of more than 70 are considered to be acceptable by the users. The net promoter score for our product um, reported to show us that we had equal number of people who were happy with the product and equal number of the people who were not happy with the product. Such score uh, determined that there is need for uh, further improvement in the design of the product. The interview analysis um, identified three themes and um, 18 sub-themes. Uh, participants reported um, factors that can influence the medication intake behavior for an older adult. We grouped them uh, under this theme. Uh, this theme had four sub-themes, health literacy, age-related physical and cognitive changes, social support system, mental and physical workload. So the knowledge of a patient about their chronic diseases as well as their medication can actually impact the way they take their medication and how consistent they are with their medication routine. Uh, health literacy has been identified as one of the patient related factors that can uh, positively impact the medication um, adherence. Um, as we age, we gain some physical and cognitive uh, deficits that can impact the way we can manage our medications, such as ability to remember to take the medication, as well as reading the prescription labels because of the poor vision, or um, accessing the tablets from a vial or from a blister bag because of the uh, physical or dexterity issues. Uh, participants also identified social support system um, as a positive link to their medication management. Uh, people who did not who were living alone and did not have any family member um, identified community pharmacy as their social support system. Um, 
To manage complex therapy regimen, mental and physical workload is an important factor because it's not only how they remember to take the medication, it's also how they are accessing the medication driving to the pharmacy um, that can impact their, the way they take their medication. The second theme um, included the facilitators to a product use. Um, we had um, seven sub-themes under this theme. So um, how simple the product is, um, it will make the product easier to use and easier to learn, which was identified as a first facilitator of our product use. Uh, similarly, user satisfaction reflects um, how a user can see themselves, can see their intention to use the product in their future. Um, participants identified that the product use did make some behavior change because they were more aware of their medication usage. However, because the duration of the study was short, we are unable to comment how long this will last. Um, participants identified some patient population where this can be a really good um, use, such as people who are experiencing medication non-adherence due to forgetfulness. Uh, familiarity with the technology was another thing. Participants who were more familiar with the technology and uh, were found that it was easier for them to adopt the technology. Uh, similarly, patients, um, participants uh, thought that since the product induced some positive emotional responses related to the sense of relief and less worry, it actually made them more intended to use the product. Um, feedback from their social circle also impact, the positive feedback from their social circle also influenced the way they see themselves by using the product in the future. In addition to the facilitator, we also identified some barrier, uh, such as product design. The large size of the product or inability to take it from outside the home um, can impact a person's decision to whether incorporate the product in their um, daily use or not. Uh, Often people use these kind of products to have a sense of relief, but if product is not reliable enough, that can impact their intention and can be a barrier to product use. Uh, participants required to have a cell phone uh, in order to receive the messages for this product. Um, recruitment was challenging for older adults because most of them still use the landline. And we were not, and the one who had a cell phone actually was sharing between um, couples. So that is something that needs to be considered. Uh, users' physical ability in order to retrieve the tablet from the blister packs and also cognitive ability, what uh, is need to be done when you hear a reminder um, can, can be a barrier to product use if they are not in that um, condition. Uh, these products associated with some kind of cost such as connectivity fee or data charges for their cell phone and can be a financial concern for older adults who lived on the uh, fixed income and retired. Uh, so we mapped back the themes and sub-themes to the framework. I really apologize for the busyness of the slide, but we tried our best. Uh, so the system usability scale, our interview analysis, and the examining the integration aspects, we found that these products were easy to use and acceptable by older adults and can be a useful tool. However, clinicians should assess an older adult's medication intake behavior as well as facilitator and products to the product use. Manufacturers should look at the areas of improve, improvement, particularly product design for a better adoption. Uh, future studies should assess how these products can induce behavior change and healthcare outcomes and cost saving. Um, I would like to thank all participants and pharmacies in the study for their time and feedback. A big thank you to the research team. And this uh, research would not be possible without the funding support from these organizations. Thank you so much. And I'm happy to take any questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Sadaf. That was a lot of information, but I think presented it really well and really, really interesting. Um, we have a question already from Jen Lake online. She asks, can you expand on the health literacy, health literacy theme? I think that was the first one you presented. Was this theme more general about medication taking behaviors? And she's interested about how the smart blister pack was more dissimilar than other adherence issues. Uh, sure. So um, we actually asked our participants that there were um, two questions that were very specific about their knowledge um, about their medication intake. So we asked them specifically about do they know why they take these medications and do they know if the taking the medication can improve their health and if they won't take them, would it affect their health in any way? We wanted to capture the health literacy that how patient that if the patients are aware uh, that their medication usage is actually something that they have discussed with their pharmacist or with their physicians, and they actually know that these medications are using for these specific 
uh, disease conditions. And we found a very variable response from them. So some patients were really well aware of their medications and chronic diseases. They knew that it is a blood thinner and I have to take it every day. I don't want to skip it. Otherwise, I'll end up having a stroke. But some of them had very ambiguous um, knowledge. Like they were like, oh, I don't know. My doctor just prescribed me. So that's why I'm taking the medication. So mm -hmm. that's that kind of information we uh, gathered together and we um, themed it under health literacy, that health literacy can actually predict how well the patient can be um, can aware of their medication intake routine and, the, um, and their uh, knowledge about the medication, that how important is it for you to take the medication. Because I believe that if we don't incorporate that education piece with our patients, um, you have to tell them the reason that you're prescribing or the reason that you are telling them to take it every day. And that will make them more um, adherent to their medication as compared to if they don't even know why they're taking it. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. Kind of a follow-up question, which I kind of feel like you might have answered a bit. Were you expecting the SMART blister pack to improve or change? So we, the, our study duration was short. It was eight weeks. So uh, we can't uh, comment that it did make any change, but most of our um, older adults did comment that they were more aware of their um, medication intake routines because they kind of feel, uh, felt that somebody was actually taking their time to reminding them to take their medication. And that kind of mm -hmm. behavior actually make them um, that I should take my medication on time because someone else is taking care of me and someone else is investing their time to take care of my uh, health. Mm -hmm. so I think the broader, um, there should be a need of like longer duration of studies where we can actually see that was that behavior change was only because it was a study because the patients felt that it's a new thing and they need to kind of like uh, try it out and they were more aware or was it something that can sustain over a longer duration of time? Yeah, that ties in really nicely. I just wanted to ask my own question based on that because I know in addition to all of this wonderful research work that you do, you also work at a family health team. And so I was curious if you had kind of um, a top tip or like a story from, from your own clinical practice in addition to the research that kind of ties together um, what the future of these devices might look like in a clinical setting. So I think it, we are still in a very early stage. Uh, there are a lot of products that are available. I honestly, before I came to this program, I wasn't even aware, even being a practicing pharmacist, that there are so many products that are available and you can just buy them off of Amazon or <laughs> eBay or somewhere. Uh, but yeah. I think um, they can be a really useful tool if we provide patients with a detailed education um, about them. Um, the patients have to be on board. That's the most important thing before you uh, incorporate these kind of products into their daily use. Um, their health, um, their caregivers, um, they would. It's a good relief for health uh, for their caregivers, especially if you're living um, far from your parents, right? My mom lives in another city. So for me to call her every day and remind her to take a medication is a task. But for me, it would be like, oh, if I can just go on an online portal and check if she has taken her medication or not, and then I can kind of like, you know, mm -hmm keep an eye on her, but at the same time, I don't want her to feel like I'm spying on her. So I think it's like a family discussion that needs to be happened before we recommend these products. And also important thing that came out um, was the cost, right? So you have a connectivity fee, you have a data charges. A lot of people don't have those cell phones that even if they have cell phone, they don't have the data with the unlimited text messaging. So I think those are the features that need to be considered before we recommend these kind of products and uh, before we actually incorporate them. I think that was the one thing that I learned through this study that uh, people do um, think about their medication behavior change, but I think there are so many factors that influence that decision. And we need to look at each and every aspect before we simply just tell a patient that here is a medication adherence device and you should incorporate it in your daily routine. Yeah, I think that's so important. And especially that piece just about integrating caregivers um, into the patient's circle of care is really, really important. So thank you so much for your presentation, Sadaf. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to pass it over to Lisa who will introduce our next research presentation. And I'm actually just going to share my screen on behalf of Sean. Wonderful, thanks. Thanks so much, Sadaf. And thanks, thanks, Anne Lisa. I'm really pleased to introduce Sean. I'm also just realizing there's a big light glow behind me. The sun is just hitting my window in the strangest of ways right now. So sorry if this is a bit glaring for everybody. Um, uh, Sean, really happy to introduce you. Introduce Sean Varghese, who's completed his Bachelor of Science, uh, Health, Bachelor of Health Sciences at McMaster University, 
and one year of PharmD studies at the University of Toronto. He is now a second year medical student at McMaster University and hopes to uh, pursue a career in psychiatry. And we're looking for you forward to your presentation and we're really pleased that you're, um, going, you're, you're working within the pharmacy medical uh, fields. And so thank you so much for continuing to be part of our community. Go ahead, Sean. All right, thanks for that introduction. I'm really happy to be here. Um, so I'm happy to share today our rapid scoping review on medication support tools at Transitions in Care. Um, this study was funded by the CIHR and I'd like to thank the Leslie Van Faculty of Pharmacy for providing a portion of my stipend. So in terms of housekeeping, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. And so the World Health Organization has made medication harm reduction a global priority and transition in care is a key action area within that priority. So a transition in care is when a person moves from one care setting, such as the hospital, to a different care setting, such as their home. And during these transitions, uh, medication discrepancies are, are common, and that can often lead to adverse drug events, hospital readmissions, and even sometimes patient death. In one Ontario study that were conducted by some of our uh, lead investigators, it was found that 30% of people uh, reported that they did not have a full understanding of their medications at the time of hospital discharge. And so this really puts um, these patients at risk of harm. Um, next slide. Thank you. And so medication support interventions are those where people can work together with their healthcare providers to try to increase their confidence and understanding in taking their medications. And so our team has been working on two such medication support interventions. Um, as you can see on the slide, there's the prompt process on the left and the pods on the right. So the prompt is a process where a fax discharge package, as well as a follow-up phone call are made from the hospital pharmacist to the community pharmacist following hospital discharge. And on the right there, we have the pods, which is a patient-oriented discharge summary, which outlines details important for the patient to know following their hospital discharge. So our current goal is to understand patient and caregiver needs regarding medication information at the time of hospital discharge. Um, and we're doing this mainly in two ways. First, um, we have the scoping review, which I'll be presenting to you today, where we take a look at the currently existing tools and what exactly we might be able to learn from them. And then our second arm of research, with my, which my colleague Shoshana will be presenting uh, to you in the next presentation, focuses on working together with stakeholders to design tools using patient-centered design methods. So unfortunately, little is actually known about what is the best way to provide medication support. So our team described uh, the tools and processes that have been studied to date, and we were trying to identify any opportunities for future research as well. So we kept our uh, research question quite broad. We're looking at any process or tool that aims to increase a patient's confidence in taking their medications. And uh, we're interested in looking at the content, layout, and process of these tools. So in terms of our methods, we opted for a rapid scoping review, which is an adaptation of the scoping review methods. Uh, in a rapid scoping review, we simplify some of the steps of scoping reviews to process information in a more timely manner. And so an example of this would be um, when we conducted our search, we studied or we did our search in those four databases. However, we did not do a gray literature search, nor did we take a look at the references of the included studies. Another example would be for the screening and data extraction phases. Instead of having two independent reviewers conduct um, both these phases independently, we had one reviewer conduct all of the screening and the data extraction and a second reviewer verify 10% of that information for accuracy. And so uh, in terms of some of the results we found, we screened over 7,000 articles. And uh, at the end, we had 60 studies that were included in our analysis. About half of them were randomized control trials. And in terms of participant selection, we found that patients were selected uh, based on criteria that we would expect, things like age, uh, medical condition, conditions, 
the number and class of medications, but very few studies actually considered individuals with high medication needs, like people who are experiencing language barriers or with low literacy levels, or those who might have physical or intellectual disability. These patients are at higher risk of adverse drug events during transitions in care, and this can lead to higher readmission rates. And so this is definitely an opportunity for future research moving forward. We also found that 75% of the studies did not really describe whether or how patients, caregivers, and healthcare providers were involved in the prototype development phase. And to us, this is an important uh, gap since including the voices of users as part of developing the solution is a key part of designing tools and processes that really meet their needs. And also 87% of the interventions did not assess the patient's preferences and values. For instance, if the patient required that the intervention be available in a specific language, uh, this wasn't necessarily an option that was available to them. Moving on to the design of these tools, so 78% of the interventions included multiple components to the intervention. And so this was typically a combination of a physical, verbal, or electronic um, component. And so an example of a physical component is something like a medication list that's printed and provided to the patient at time of discharge. An example of a verbal component is something like um, patient education and counseling from the healthcare provider to the patient right before they're discharged from the hospital regarding how to take their medications. And an example of an electronic component could be something like a, a video that is shown to the patient uh, prior to their discharge um, that gives them some information regarding a newly diagnosed medical condition or a new medication that they've been started on. And so over 50% of the interventions that were included in our study were specifically a combination of a physical component and a verbal component. And actually very few studies, uh, less than 10%, um, included an electronic component in their intervention. And we found this somewhat surprising uh, given that we're currently moving to more of a digital world. And again, this indicates uh, an area for future exploration. Uh, we also, sorry, we also found that 42% of the interventions included a follow-up component. So they had um, some component of the intervention earlier on, and then at a later time point, they had an uh, another component. So in terms of the content of what was actually included um, in these interventions, there were 38 out of the 60 studies that included a physical or electronic document uh, containing the patient's medication list. And so we specifically looked at these 38 studies and we uh, tried to assess what information regarding the medication was included in these lists. So we found that the indication or reason for use, the timing and frequency of administration, as well as common side effects of the medication were commonly included in uh, some of these documents, whereas other information such as the rooted administration, uh, the patient's allergies, and drug, drug, or drug food interactions uh, weren't included in as many of them. In terms of the process of these interventions, um, just about 50% of interventions were delivered before the patient was discharged from the hospital, and about 30% of the interventions had components that were delivered before hospital discharge as well as after hospital discharge. The pharmacist was the most commonly uh, involved healthcare provider involved in over 50% of the interventions, um, and physicians and nurses were also commonly involved, involved in about 25% of interventions each. About one-fifth of the interventions did include multiple healthcare, healthcare providers, um, usually some combination of a pharmacist, physician, or nurse, and only 27% of the interventions recorded training for staff administering the intervention. And for many of these, it wasn't necessarily clear whether the staff did not require training to administer that intervention, or if the um, information was not included in the manuscript. So in conclusion, we identified several opportunities for future research. Uh, research on medication support tools at Transitions in Care would benefit from greater focus on people with high medication needs, uh, such as those with disabilities, uh, low literacy levels, and language barriers. And they would also benefit from more explicit reporting of the developmental process of uh, developing that tool.
Most of the studies that we saw focused on written and verbal education provided at discharge, but future studies could further explore electronic tools and uh, different strategies like missed medication alerts or medication time reminders. And so these findings are now being used in the next step of our project, where we're using extreme user co-design with populations most at risk to develop uh, a medication support tool. And so after that, once we have a prototype, we'll study the tool to assess whether it improves med the patient's medication experience and if it optimizes medication management at transitions in care. And I'd like to thank our team for all their hard work. And this concludes my presentation. Thanks, Sean. Sorry, I'm just juggling <laughs> multiple screens here. Um, that's great. Thank you so much for that presentation. I am not seeing any questions online right now, but I'm wondering because I know Shoshana's um, research, which she's going to be presenting next, I'm wondering if we should maybe segue right into her presentation and then the two of you can maybe field questions together after that. Um, yeah, and then that'll give good. people a little bit more time to digest all those beautiful graphs and charts <laughs> that you presented and uh, put together their questions. So I think if that sounds good to everyone, I will pass it over to Lisa who will do, who will introduce Shoshana and then we'll, we'll do a Q&A after her presentation. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Annalise. Uh, again, pleased to welcome another member of the team, Shoshana Han Goldberg, who is a scientist and project lead at Open Lab and an assistant professor at the Leslie Dan Faculty of Pharmacy. She works with a multidisciplinary team, as we've learned, to discover and create solutions to issues in the health system using techniques that span design, research, and operational modeling. Uh, so interestingly, she has a PhD in industrial engineering from the University of Toronto, and we're really thrilled that the pharmacy and engineering communities can collaborate because we think it's so important to be able to use, you know, to, to access and, and collaborate with your expertise, Shoshana. So thank you so much for being here and for, uh, for all of your team uh, for presenting your work today. I'll turn it over to you. Right. Well, thanks so much for that introduction. And I will just start sharing my screen. Um, yeah, so um, my presentation is called Creating Patient-Oriented Medication Tools with Patients, Families, and Healthcare Providers. And um, I have uh, no conflicts of interest to disclose. And uh, so building on Sean's presentation, um, discharge summaries in general um, are a recognized priority and uh, complex tool that can that can be used to help uh, deliver discharge instructions, including information about medication changes during transitions in care. Um, currently, the discharge summaries don't really include patient oriented medication lists. There are and there are priority groups at higher risk of adverse events due to complexity or medication of, of medication information and communication challenges. Um, so as Sean mentioned, um, our team has been working on two different initiatives um, that kind of target this transition in care. And uh, PODS is, is, is one of them. And one of the limitations that we saw with PODS um, was that the med, MedRec is generally a separate process from all the other discharge information and discharge instructions that are given to patients and families. Um, so they really it really needs its own separate uh, separate tool. Um, and similarly from prompt um, that was looking at communication between hospital and community pharmacists. Um, one of its limitations was the involvement of patients and families and how they fit into that process. So uh, as John mentioned, our objective was to understand the current experiences and needs and then to design tools to support medication information transfer. And so today, in this presentation, I'll be talking about the project arm that was designing prototypes together with end users. Um, and we used uh, a theory called extreme user design, which really says those who are affected by design the most should have a say in the design process. And that's really those people who are more at risk for adverse events um, due to complex medication information or communication challenges. 
And specifically for this project, we work together with patients and families and healthcare providers uh, in the area of patients who have disabilities, both physical disabilities. We worked with spinal cord injury patients um, and adults with developmental disabilities, um, as well as patients with language barriers. Uh, so our design process uh, followed the three I's method, which is inspiration, ideation, and implementation. Um, so in the inspiration phase, uh, we did some secondary research looking at our previous work um, with the patient-oriented discharge summaries um, and interviews we had done with patients to see what they had talked about in terms of their medication needs. We looked at popular uh, mobile apps um, and we did new interviews with patients, families, and providers. Um, and then in the ideation phase, um, we created some personas and scenarios and held a prototyping workshops where teams of patients, providers, uh, patient education, professionals, and designers came together to kind of develop prototypes of what a tool might look like that would support uh, medication information transfer during transitions and care. We then use those prototypes to, we, we refined those prototypes and took them out to focus groups of uh, patient groups in these extreme user groups um, where they did some role play using the tools to see, to give further feedback and refine them. Um, and then implementation, that will be our future work of testing um, and further refining and seeing how it fits into systems that exist and processes of uh, transitions and care. So what did we learn? Um, so current experiences, we learned that there isn't really enough time spent uh, reviewing before discharge. Patients and families want to be more involved in creating their medication routines and learning about um, their medication changes and medication information. Uh, while the patients are in the hospital, usually their providers take care of all their medications. So the nurses and the, and the doctors, they give them all their medications. They're not really so involved. Um, and then when they get home, they're overwhelmed um, by these changes and instructions. There's often conflicts in medication instructions um, by what is given verbally um, or what's available. They might have certain instructions written down or that they've been told. And then when they get to the pharmacy, that specific uh, medication formula is not available. Um, they need to make some changes and that causes confusion. Um, and we also learned uh, that community pharmacists are a valuable yet hidden resource. We heard many times from patients that, uh, and families that they didn't know how much of a resource their community pharmacist could be to them, um, and they wish they had been told that beforehand. Uh, in terms of informing tool design, we learned that there's potentially a lot of important information um, about medications and what's important might differ from patient to patient. Um, and there's a desire for customization um, and being involved in figuring out what are what about each medication is important to that patient. Um, people love blister packs and charts in terms of design and format. Uh, we learned that it's important to think about how patients and their families think about their medications and their routines and how it fits into their, uh, into their regular life and considering that when we make medication schedules for them. Um, consideration of patient and family family needs and education and communication. Um, and with our prototypes, we really uh, sought to keep in mind how to keep it simple and still allow access to all the content that is desired um, and how to create a tool that promotes a good process that involves the patient and family, um, like a tool that kind of promotes that process. So as we came up in the end with two different tools. Uh, the first is a medication whiteboard, um, and it engages the patient and family in creating their ma medication routine. Um, there's also, you can write on it, but there's also a set of magnetic tiles that represent medications, the reasons for taking medications, and tips on how to take them for patients who have communication difficulties. 
Um, so I'm just going to show both of those. So this is an image of the whiteboard. And um, as you can see, it's kind of broken up by time of day, and then it has information about the medication. Uh, what's it be like for what? Why am I taking this medication? How to take? Um, so those could be tips um, such as this patient really needs to be distracted while they take this medication, or they like this one mixed into chocolate pudding. Um, it could be tips that the family has to help the nurses give the patient medications, or it could be tips that the nurses have found really work well that then the, pa the family can see what's working and then they'll know about it when they get home um, and things to watch for. So kind of keeping an eye on the, really uh, this is a way to involve the patient and family in developing their medication routine. Um, and here's just some images of the magnetic tiles that can be used um, that can be helpful both for those with communication challenges and language barriers. Um, the second tool that we came up with was the patient-oriented medication list uh, that's really meant to serve two purposes. One is supporting the communication of medication instructions during transitions in care. Um, and then the second is a reference medication list that they can use once at home. Uh, it also communicates which medications to stop taking and information on how the community pharmacist can help and who to call for questions. Um, and we did find when talking to um, pharmacies in the hospital that some are making these kind of charts for their patients on their own, but it, maybe it doesn't have all these components or and they can't do it for everyone. It's not built into the system. Um, so you can see here there, at the top left, there's a little, there's check boxes to say, okay, which medications did I already take today before I went home? Um, it has the patient's name. It has contact information of who to, of if there's questions and where to pick up the medications um, and whether a checkbox to say whether or not they've been ordered. And then information about their medications they should be taking a separate list of which medications to stop. That's another thing we found that often in a discharge summary, um, the medications that should be stopped and that should be taken are all mixed together in the same list, um, which can be really confusing um, for, for people. Um, and an extra reminder to tell uh, patients to take any unused medications to the pharmacy, and then a place to write extra notes or if this is given to the patient ahead of a little bit ahead of time, they can jot down some questions that they want to remember to ask um, whoever is going over their instructions with them. Um, so just a quick conclusion, um, medication instructions received in hospital feels rushed and results in unanswered questions and tools that involve patients and families in the process of developing their medication routines may help improve uh, patient understanding. And a big thank you to the project team, the co-authors, um, advisory team. Uh, we had some really, really helpful end user groups involved, a self-advocate group at CAMH, um, the Spinal Cord Injury Program at CRI, and the Chinese Hepatitis B Peer Support Group at Toronto General, um, and then some other folks at Open Lab. And that brings me to the end of that. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And thanks for showing us those images of the of the two tools. I'm obviously a very visual person. And I just think being able to see exactly what you're talking about was was a really nice feature. Um, I feel like questions are pouring in. So Sean, I'll just bring you back into the conversation as well. And you two can go back and forth about what you want to answer. I'll maybe read out um, question and comment from Jim and Barb. So Jim Would says, it be we recently... stop sharing that way. Yeah, yeah sure. Okay. Yeah. And then we'll have our faces front and center. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Jim says, we routinely hear patient objections to blister and strip packs. I'm not old enough and sick enough for that yet. So his question is, did all of your subjects really love those? And then Barb just kind of as a follow-up comment about that's really interesting, Jim. I often find people don't like the way the blister packs reduce their control. I used to know all my medications really well and I could read the label. So maybe Shoshana, do you want to start us off with that? Maybe. And um, so I wouldn't say everyone loved the blister pack, but it is something we heard over and over again that they like their blister packs or their 
um, those little rows of, you know, not necessarily a blister pack where you like punch the things out, but uh, uh, the little containers where you can put in the medications for each day or time um, to organize them. Oh, but so not everybody, but we heard it a lot. Mm -hmm. Right. So maybe I'll just move along. The questions are pouring in, so I'm probably going to ask both of you to maybe take a look in the chat box after. But I'll read out Carlo's question next. As baby boomers, at least the tail end, who are more tech comfortable, move into the elderly age group, painfully I aware that I'm one of those individuals. Um, how do you see our approaches to helping patients through transitions of care changing over time? Yeah, I think it was interesting in the review, we didn't see a lot of electronic solutions. Um, in our prototypes, they're not designed to be electronic or not electronic. Um, they're meant to be able to be in either way. So you should be able to, like, I guess a whiteboard is a whiteboard, but uh, that list should could be electronic. It could be an electronic, built into the electronic record. Um, I think that in the future, like more of that will happen. Um, and it, we weren't really, we weren't really, that's not kind of outside of scope for, for what we were doing, but the prototype isn't meant to necessarily be a paper process. Mm -hmm. Okay, that kind of ties into this next question from Jen, which I am going to sneak in as well. So she says, great presentation, Sean and Shoshana. With the wider use of patient portals or open access charting, such as open notes, how do you capitalize on this during the prototyping and thinking ahead of the paper list? I think that's such a perfect follow-up question. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah, ideally, they, this should be on the patient portal and they should be able to go in and see it at any time. Um, so... I think from my work on the patient-oriented discharge summary in hospitals, most hospitals are not quite there yet, um, but hopefully soon. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you for those. I know there's, I think, three or four more questions in the chat box. I think Lisa McCarthy is also tackling some of the, the Q&A, but maybe Sean and Shoshana, if you wouldn't mind taking a look in the chat box and addressing what you can, that would be absolutely wonderful. But thank you both so much for your presentation. I think that worked really well to have them one after each other. So I will now pass it back to Lisa who is going to start to close us out with our discussant remarks. Wonderful, thanks so much Annalise and thanks uh, thanks so much Sean and Shoshana for uh, that, those presentations. Uh, I'm really pleased to now introduce Kelly Grinrod who is an associate professor at the University of Waterloo School of Pharmacy. Her research includes novel ways to bring research findings to today's busy medical clinics and pharmacy counters, namely through innovations and in mobile technologies. After completing her pharmacy degree at the University of Alberta and a hospital pharmacy residency at London Health Sciences Centre, she moved to UBC to do a PharmD uh, and a Master of Science degree and a postdoctoral fellowship, and she's been at the University of Waterloo School of Pharmacy since 2011. And we've seen a little bit of her research through uh, part of her research teams with uh, her collaborations with others today. Um, I'm, I'm going to turn it now over to you, Kelly, and looking forward to your commentary on uh, all that you've uh, heard this afternoon. Thanks so much, Lisa. Um, yeah, so I mean, every one of these presentations was uh, um, wonderfully interesting for me. Uh, we, for years through Farm 5 and 5 and other collaborations, I worked for years with uh, systems design engineers, so I was very happy to see engineering. Um, I've learned a lot about how, you know, you have to in design intentionally, um, the different disciplines approach it with completely different perspectives. Um, I've worked a lot with uh, our local um, digital arts uh, faculty at the school, um, gaming researchers, and so it this this kind of interdisciplinary work that we've seen happen over and over really just I think stands to push pharmacy research so much further. Um, I really appreciate you know starting off with uh, uh, Dr. Moriarty's presentation on quality assurance, and I'm actually going to talk through the presentations just through the perspective of um, uh, uh, vaccines. So um, I am the the pharmacy lead for my region's public health unit for our vaccine rollout, and having done a lot of this kind of work for so many years, 
now being in the position of, of helping to make real time decisions with rapidly changing information. Um, the, the game is constantly changing, the rules of the game are constantly changing, the game pieces are constantly changing, the players of the game are constantly changing. And, and the idea of doing uh, quality assurance is a big question that we're not quite sure um, how to approach this, you know. And so uh, thinking through all these various ways, as uh, Dr. Moriarty pointed out, uh, at the very beginning of his presentation, you know, there's this idea that things you can do more, things that you can do less, things that you can do differently. And we're having to implement exactly those kinds of thoughts. We open up a mass immunization clinic. Okay, so what's working well? What do we need to do more of? What is slowing things down? What do we need to do less of? And how do we do things differently? Um, we're also, as we start to move to pharmacies, taking the vaccinations on with the approval of AstraZeneca in Canada a couple of days ago, um, there's also things too, like it, it starts to be out of the control of public health. And so how do you put in policies that actually ensure that things are being uh, delivered uh, with a certain amount of fidelity to the intention of the program, um, whether it's through policies, financial incentives, uh, regulations. Um, and so I, I appreciate this as this constantly evolving process. And so Suzanne's work, Dr. Ketteret's work was, I'm so glad to see that Atlas. I mean, wow, good job on that. Um, incredibly, uh, interesting and relevant to have that kind of real world um, decision-making information as we're looking at, you know, in a pandemic, the pandemic has taught us more than anything. You need to know about what you're doing now. You need to be able to pivot quickly and relying it almost, it's interesting. We go back and we read papers that might be from three years ago. And sometimes it feels like they're from another planet or another country or another life. Um, because things that we were doing and evaluating and thinking, maybe we were a bit naive, but also not even being, it, it's the hard to apply that old practice and that old life to the new life. And we often talk about the new, you know, getting back to normal, but there's also this recognition we may be heading into a new normal. We may never quite go back to normal. It will, you know, post pandemic period will be a different period. Um, so I really appreciate that. It just it really well thought out. So again, really good job on that. Um, Rand, of course, has is, is been working on five and five, which we did a lot of user centered design on that. And we had some user testing recently where someone had said, you know, I do the CPD that my employer makes me do. I do five and five for myself because it's something I like to do. And to us, that was such a win because it highlighted that sometimes user centered design and even the use of theory, which is what Rand's review had found, theory may actually improve satisfaction more than anything else. It's not even necessarily that it has a huge impact on behavior. Satisfaction is a really important outcome when you have to try and get people engaged in something that's self-directed. Um, so we're starting to see the payoffs of those years of, of involvement uh, of our users in multiple rounds of user testing and involving engineers and involving um, digital design people and, and involving games researchers. Um, SADAF is also experiencing that. I mean, they're they're basically taking these I, these things that are, and I think with SADAF's work too, um, based on my understanding of it, similar to what Sean had pointed to, you know, you see lots of these systems designed without actual users being involved. My favorite thing to do is to watch Dr. Patel, uh, SADAF's supervisor, take an adherence pack of some sort and just say, okay, here's all the things that are going to go wrong as soon as you get a patient with Parkinson's, as soon as you get a patient with dementia. Um, and, but then also that next step of actually taking it to these people and then really thoughtfully thinking through, as uh, Shoshana was talking through, really thoughtfully thinking through how you might design it and what's important to them. And I actually wonder if that's part of the explanation for the work that was seen there is um, when you engage people at a different stage and, and get them to think through things differently, um, when you introduce an intervention not designed for them, they, they can reject it even on that basis, just not the feeling of not being reflected in it. But when you start to involve them in the process and they start to imagine the way it applies to their life, they can not only adopt things that maybe were designed for other people, but help you innovate and shift it rather than having to go back to the drawing board and start again. So yeah, I think more than anything is, as we think through, for example, vaccine clinics, because that's all I'm thinking about nowadays, even the idea, a lot of what I'm listening to here, I plan to take back there, but I hope that many of you are also able to contribute your design expertise to these. The idea of one of our, our biggest things was we're about to start a mass immunization clinic tomorrow. And one of the decisions was to open it early with our oldest participants. So people you know over the age of 90, not a whole lot of them and get them through to make sure that we use our, our um, most vulnerable group age-wise to help us find the problems as we go through without the pressure of having a huge lineup out the door. Um, and it was really about 
it was user experience testing was a lot of what we're doing, talking with engineers about that. Um, also the idea of co-designing clinics, uh, we see this reflected in the US where they have, um, as pharmacies are, are taking on vaccinating more, you know, the idea that they take a mobile team and they run it through a church and they have the reverend book the appointments through the church because the people who the people say they may not have gone to get vaccinated but the reverend called them and booked them an appointment on the phone and that's what made them go there's a, a lot of co-design in, in certain communities for example minority populations often have the church present and so co-design helps you see that it's it that's the place that you bring these things so yeah i just really well done all of you really interesting um and i will leave it there thank you Thanks so much, Kelly. Uh, fabulous uh, reflections and words to tie a lot of the presentations together, uh, thinking at that by, uh, of the health system at large, but all the different components that I think research aids in influencing practice and policy and in uh, forward thinking, uh, given what many of us are involved in with this, the vaccination efforts and all of us are involved in, in building up uh, the uptake of vaccines across all of our many communities. So. Um, thank you so much, Kelly, for all of that. And I want to thank all of our speakers today for uh, incredible uh, presentations, lots of thinking uh, that you've inspired in many of us, and uh, the chat that occurred as well uh, over the course of the afternoon. It's been a really great day. It's been a really great uh, four sessions for OPEN, uh, for the OPEN Summit this year. Again, while it's not the way we normally come together for an OPEN Summit, it's the way uh, we've learned how to do it well over the last year. And I think um, uh, as a community of, of, um, of researchers, of policymakers, of practitioners, of patients in many cases, um, and educators, thinking about medication management and having these focused opportunities over the last month to do so has been a, a really wonderful experience. It's been great to connect with many of you and many new people involved as well as we've had the conversations we've had uh, for more information on OPEN, uh, and Elise has nicely put up our, uh, our website. Uh, if you'd like to join the mailing list, please do let us know. And uh, we're gonna ask for your evaluations of this as we have for other sessions as well. It's really gonna be helpful to us to know um, if you thought this experience was a helpful one, um, if you, if, you know, how should we uh, approach our summit planning in the future when hopefully we'll have a bit more flexibility as to where, whether we can do it in person or uh, virtually and, and maybe that uh, there's benefits to doing it this way that we need to hear about so that we, uh, we take that forward in our planning. As well, there's more information about the Center for Practice Excellence. So Annalise has kindly now switched to that uh, web page as well. Um, so uh, I guess in closing, thank, thanks as well to Annalise for all of your incredible uh, work that you've done behind the scenes to help us be so successful in mounting this experience for your excellent moderation today uh, and question, just moderating the questions in the chat and the technical expertise that you have had and brought to this. So we really appreciate it. Um, thanks to everybody for participating. And again, looking forward to your feedback and looking forward to meeting and seeing many of you in different ways uh, over these uh, next few months as we learn more about uh, everyone's research in the next stages that they, uh, they get to. So thanks to everyone and I hope everyone has the next uh, best next part of your day, good part of your day. Take care. Thank you.